From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. I'm David Weston. Big news on Capitol Hill this week is going to be the commencing of the impeachment trial, the second impeachment trial against President Trump, which is due to start tomorrow. Today we got briefs from Mr. Trump, as well as we should get the rules of the road for how the process is going to work. But even as we go into this impeachment trial, the polling really indicates the nation remains pretty much divided, first over whether Mr. Trump should be convicted or not, but also over whether, in fact, he truly lost the election. When we want to know what the American people are thinking, there's one person we go to. That is famed pollster and political strategist Frank Luntz. And so thank you very much for being with us, Frank. You understand this. Give us a sense, because I saw some AP polling, for example, that said it's really, really divided about in the middle about whether he should be convicted or not. Is that what you're seeing? Well, if you voted for Donald Trump, 67 percent of those who voted for Donald Trump believe that he won the election and the election was stolen. And that's not only remarkable, that's dangerous for the economy. It's dangerous for the country. It's dangerous for the future. When you have that degree of people who simply distrust what actually happened, when they reject the facts, you've got to be nervous. And the problem is that they're getting the information to affirm them rather than inform them. They're not curious about it. They're not open to being challenged about it. Uh, the numbers have stayed there now for the last couple of months. And frankly, David, I'm nervous for the country that this impeachment trial starting tomorrow is going to heighten and, and continue to divide us at a time when we need to be finding common ground. Well, see, that's the critical point, it seems to me, Frank, because most observers do not expect them to get the two-thirds majority required for a conviction in the Senate. And therefore, people are saying, including Democrats, are saying, no, this is really something for the American people, for us to lay out the case so they can see it. Uh, is it likely that, in fact, they will persuade more people of their position by seeing it in the impeachment trial? And what I've been told by Democrats in the Senate, they suggest this is going to be like a movie, like a really powerful, emotional uh, presentation. And it, we're going to see footage that we've never seen before. We're going to hear from witnesses that we haven't heard from before. And they're going to lay it out as much as, as a documentary would, point by point. Less about the constitutionality about this and more about how it was wrong. Now, on the Republican side, this is going to give Donald Trump, if he is acquitted, it's going to give him the chance to say, you see, they tried a second time. They tried to take me down and even though the Democrats control the Senate, even they can't agree on this. I've been exonerated, and we're going to get even with them four years from now. I'm frightened about the outcome of this, because I think the Democrats are going to be able to make their case that what happened was horrific. And Trump is going to be able to make his case that he is a victim. So both sides will be even more entrenched, even more divided. And there's no one in the middle that that really can can bring us all together. And Frank, I'm, I'm curious, from your talking to people, the focus groups you do, might the Republicans' primary argument really appeal to a lot of Americans, which is this. Maybe I really disagree with what the president did. Maybe I even think it was inciting insurrection. But he's gone. It's over. Let's move on, because that's really the Republicans' defense is you shouldn't be trying the guy after he's out of office. It's not only is it the Republican defense, but a, the, a clear majority of Americans feel that way. Even those who want him convicted do think that this is about the past. But in the end, this is all about the election in 2022. And the Democrats are doing everything they can to separate the Republican Party from the voters in the suburbs who need to bring the Republicans back. If they're to go from 213 seats in the House to majority of 218. David, our Senate is 50-50. Is our House is 221 to 213. We've never had a government in a long, long time that is this evenly divided. And so there's a lot at stake politically, not just constitutionally, with what's going to happen starting tomorrow. Well, let's talk about 2022 in light of this impeachment trial we're going to see here. As you know better than I, Frank, if you go back through history, traditionally the party that comes in loses a fair number of seats in the House and some in the Senate as well. The Democrats can't afford to lose almost any. What could turn that around? Is anything in this impeachment trial likely to change that pattern? They're trying to ensure that the votes that Donald Trump lost back in November don't return to the GOP. And remember that even though Trump lost by 4.5%, the Republicans actually gained 15 seats in the House. So there are people who are willing to split their ticket, vote against Donald Trump because they didn't like him. Those are primarily voters in the suburbs. Uh, women with children. And they're nervous that those people, now that Trump is gone, will return to the GOP. So they're trying to drive a wedge 
and they're going to use this trial to, to do it. But in the end, these are economic voters. If they are better off two years from now than they are today, they're more likely to reward the Democrats. If things have not improved in a couple of years, they're more likely to punish them. But to get the advantage, to seize the advantage, those these next seven days are going to matter for the Democrats. Uh, Frank, we have a viewer writing in, actually, with a question, and that is, by invoking this language of inciting, uh, might the Democrats actually be putting themselves in a position down the road where they could be criticized? Because there's an awful lot of strong language being used these days on both sides of the political equation. Does it make sense for them to start saying, oh, boy, you're inciting now? That's uh, impeachable. Well, we know Maxine Waters, who's uh, very important to viewers and listeners, and she did that by saying to people, challenge, if you're a Donald Trump supporter, challenge them. Take them on in restaurants, take them on in gas stations. Or you had uh, Representative Omar, who said some very insightful things about Israel and the, uh, and the Jewish community, that we've had both sides, and really, we need to tone it down. It's one of the reasons why businesses have taken a step backward out of politics, said that they're going to postpone their donations at least for a couple of years. They're sending a message. The economic community is sending a message to Washington. Tone it down. In the end, bring us together, get the economy back on track, address and resolve COVID, and let's stop with this horrific hyperpartisanship that's been so damaging to the country now for for over four years. And is there an, an openness on the part of voters that you talk with to toning it down? And let me connect it up with President Biden, because whatever you think about what he's doing right now, whether you agree with him or disagree with him, I think it's fair to say he has toned it down to a significant degree. He is, but in the end, in the end, it's really about deeds rather than words. So he put forward a $1.9 trillion package. Did he compromise on that, or is he willing to compromise on that? Is he willing to do $1.6 trillion? Is he willing to give the Republicans anything? And are the Republicans willing to come towards him, acknowledging that he was elected president, that he does, that they do owe him some sense of leadership in this? The public is going to decide whether or not these people are sincere, whether or not they're genuine. I will tell you that I am as frightened now as I have been ever in my professional life, because there are more people who are not listening to each other. There are more people who have drawn those sharp lines. Joe Biden is the right person to have as president right now for his language. The question is, do the deeds match the words? Well, but that's the question, isn't it, Frank? And that's, I think, what the Biden administration is confronting right now. On the one hand, if you actually compromise, it looks like you really believe in the unity that President Biden talked about in the inauguration speech. But you said a few minutes ago, ultimately in 2022, it's going to be, am I better off than I was two years ago? And maybe they think that $1.9 trillion, every single penny of it, is necessary to make sure they can deliver on that to the American people. They know that if they, that if they spend the money now, if they keep the money flowing into the economy, they know it's going to make a difference. It made a difference for the last six months. But then we're going to have a debt. Then we're going to have higher taxes. We're going to have uh, crowding out of the, of the marketplace. So there are consequences to this. And the question that Joe Biden and his administration has to answer for the public, at what point are we doing too much in the short term that's going to have a negative impact on the long term? And quite frankly, for the Republicans, at what point do you have to help people who are struggling, who are trying to make ends meet, uh, who are trying to get their lives back to normal? These are very legitimate questions on both sides. Quite frankly, David, both sides have a legitimate argument to make, and one would hope that they would try to make that argument together. Okay, Frank, thank you so much. You see what we always turn to Frank Luntz when we want to understand what the American people are thinking. He is the acclaimed pollster and political strategist. And we're going to have more with him in the next hour on Bloomberg Radio as Balance of Power continues. But in the meantime, we want to get a check on the markets. And for that, we go to Abigail Doolittle. So risk on, but maybe not quite as on as it was a little while ago. Yeah, a little bit of hesitancy as we're going on during this day. But nonetheless, David, a sixth update for the S&P 500 in a row. The longest winning streak since August. More all-time highs, and it has to do with that reflation trade. But to your point, at the highs, we were up more than half a percent. We've come back a little bit because uh, not so long ago, we were up just two tenths of one percent. So stocks had started to fade a little bit. I think behind that, David, it has to do with the reflation part of the trade has actually gone away to some degree today. We still have the short end of the yield curve backing up, uh, but the 710 and 30 year uh, bonds are down now. Excuse me, bonds are higher, yields are lower. So I think that for a moment that put a pause in the stock. But for the most part, these bulls, 
remain in charge, David. Okay, thank you so much to Abigail Doolittle for that report on the markets. Coming up here, the next step in President Biden's stimulus bill from Democratic Congresswoman from Florida, Kathy Castor. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. Texas Congressman Ron Wright is dead after battling cancer and COVID-19. The Republican is the first sitting member of Congress to die after testing positive for COVID. His office says he had been hospitalized for the past two weeks since contracting the virus. In a statement, House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy calls Wright a fighter who passionately served his constituents. Texas and America. Congressman Ron Wright was 67 years old. The New York Mets City Field Baseball Stadium will open Wednesday as a mass vaccination site. Mayor Bill de Blasio says half of the doses will be reserved for Queens residents, while the rest will be for taxi and food delivery drivers. A similar setup opened at Yankee Stadium in the Bronx on Friday. New York City has administered nearly a million vaccine doses so far. Greece's left-wing opposition leader is accusing the country's prime minister of ignoring lockdown rules. A video posted on social media shows Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis at an outdoor lunch with at least 25 people in attendance. The government toughened lockdown measures last week in response to a surge in COVID-19 infections. Opposition leader Alexis Tsipras says the prime minister showed, quote, unbelievable arrogance, end quote. Britain's official terrorism threat level has been lowered from severe to substantial. That's the middle rung of the government's five-point scale, meaning an attack in Britain is likely. In November, the threat level was raised to severe, meaning an attack was highly likely after deadly attacks in Austria and France. The UK level has been at severe most of the time since 2014. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Thanks so much, Mark. Mm -hmm. The House of Representatives passed its version of that budget resolution on Friday, meaning that this week it's going to turn to the details of the stimulus package, with Speaker Pelosi saying she would like to get it done in two weeks. We welcome now one of those who will be doing the work on this. She is Kathy Castor. She's a Democratic congresswoman from Florida who serves on the Energy and Commerce Committee. And we have to start with it's not just from Florida. You're from Tampa Bay. So congratulations. You had a big win yesterday. Hey, thank you, David. And uh, hello, everyone from Tampa, Super Bowl City. We are so excited. What a fantastic game that was. Yeah, it, it was great to watch. So congratulations. So let's turn now to the stimulus package, relief package, whatever you want to call it. As we get down to brass tacks, if we can put it that way, what are the issues you think that you particularly need to focus on? It's crushing COVID. Uh, that is job number one, making sure the vaccine distribution continues to ramp up so that everyone can get vaccinated and we can get back to work safely. But it also means, and in the Energy and Commerce Committee, we'll be focusing on those health provisions. So vaccine ramp up, also better testing. We're still going to have to have uh, a widespread and rapid testing protocol. We need to make sure we're investing in the genetic uh, fingerprint of the variants and of COVID-19. So we are, we're gonna have a lot of work for our scientists to help us. And that goes hand in hand with folks getting back to work. Janet Yellen has said that there are 10 million Americans out of work, another 4 million uh, who have dropped out of the workforce. And if we're gonna rebuild the economy, job one is controlling COVID, crushing it, and then providing those pathways for our neighbors to get back to work. So there's a fair amount of money that's already been appropriated and has either gone out the door or is on its way out the door. How much more needs to be put into COVID, whether it's testing, whether it's vaccination, and how fast can you really get it out there? Because we're all anxious, as you know, to try to get to that 75% roughly of vaccination. Yeah, significant investment in ramping up vaccine distribution. President Biden uh, has a national strategy to do that. And in fact, when I was with Roger Goodell 
uh, this weekend, he said that all of the NFL stadiums will be offered as vaccination sites here in, in Tampa. Our Raymond James Stadium has been a testing site, but boy, we would like to have, ramp up the vaccinations. We're going to have to do more on mobile uh, vaccine distribution to think about all of their older neighbors who are homebound. We need to go to them. We need to make sure that teachers are vaccinated so that kids can get back to school safely. I hear that from my neighbors across uh, the state of Florida. They need their kids back in school. Kind of feels like a lost year. So maybe we need to do more in the summer programs as well for kids to make up some lost ground. And then uh, the other the the other event this weekend with uh, the NFL was with the commissioner handing out food with our local food bank, feeding Tampa Bay. And it was remarkable, David, to see car after car, family after family, uh, who still, they're still in need of food assistance. So that will continue to be a focus as well. We saw photos of you with Roger Goodell, the NFL commissioner, out there handing out f uh, food over the weekend. Uh, and there is a big problem with food insecurity. At the same time, there are some now are questioning whether you need all of that $1.9 trillion. Some of it I don't think anybody disagrees with. You have the 10 Republican senators saying we, we need at least $620 billion or something like that. But but do we need all the $1.9 trillion? And more important, uh, are we possibly, in by spending the money now, not having the money down the road for things like infrastructure? Well, what we learned coming out of the Great Recession was the, the uh, difficulty is if you go too low, then you don't have the bounce back in the economy. And we, we just want to avoid that at all costs. Uh, I don't think we're going to have to worry about crowding out infrastructure investment. A lot of us want to pay for that. We, you know, go back to pay as you go for some of the transportation and infrastructure investments. But this is the time to do it. Interest rates are low. Economists across the political spectrum are saying do this now. Uh, you have to provide that that structural support uh, to rebuild the economy in a fair and equitable way and in a way that is long lasting. That's why in the first package, it's making sure folks have rental assistance, food, we get kids back in school, we crush COVID. The sooner we crush COVID, then we can begin the building blocks for investments in transportation and infrastructure that this country so desperately needs. And what's the situation in Florida specifically? Well, good news is uh, we can go outside. We can spread out a little bit more. The uh, It looks like the number of cases are down, but here's the, the cautionary tale. We have widespread uh, uh, variant. Uh, up, uh, the, the variant is spreading rapidly throughout the state, so people really need to, to be vigilant again. There were a lot of Super Bowl parties and a lot of celebrating. Those folks need to go get tested. Uh, soon over the next couple of days in case they did contract COVID and especially one of the more transmissible transmissible variants. Uh, but folks are eager here to get back uh, to normal. So it's, it's imperative that we all do follow the public health protocols, mass social distance. Uh, we're looking forward to how we're going to have our Super Bowl celebration, uh, the championship celebration when the Tampa Bay Lightning won the Stanley Cup, yeah, yeah. we had a big boat parade, and that might be on tap again. Yeah, Tampa has had quite a year. There's no question about that when it comes to sports. I have to have a change of tone here to something sad because I'd be remiss if I didn't offer you an opportunity to respond to one of the COVID deaths we just had today, which is one of your colleagues, uh, Congressman Ron Wright, of uh, Republican from Texas. Uh, he, of course, had lung cancer he'd been battling for some time. It's a very sad story. But he did contract COVID, and he passed away today. So any thoughts you have on the loss of your Republican colleague? David, I heard this right before we came on air, and I am so sorry. And on behalf of all of my constituents here in the Tampa Bay area, we send our condolences and love and prayers to uh, the congressman's family and everyone across Texas. It's, again, a cautionary tale. We've really got to look out for folks with with underlying conditions and uh, you know, you may feel healthy, you may be asymptomatic, but remember what could happen. There are vulnerable neighbors out there. So so please continue to wear masks and we, we will work to get the vaccine uh, rollout ramped up as quickly as possible. Okay, thank you so very much. Always great to have you with us. That's Congresswoman Kathy Castor, Democrat of Florida. And to recap, 
Sadly, Representative Ron Wright, Republican of Texas, passed away today from complications from COVID. He was 67. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Palantir is our stock of the hour after it announced a deal with IBM that set shares up 15 percent at the high. Emma Chandra is here to explain what this deal means for the two companies. So this was a big deal. It was a big deal, David. It is a big deal. And we saw Palantir hit an intraday record on the news. It's a data analytics company. And as you mentioned, they're entering now a global partnership with IBM. What are they going to do? Well, they're going to offer IBM a software that makes it IBM's own AI, artificial intelligence software, easier to use for non-technical customers, something that IBM called a natural fit for them. Why is it good? Well, for Palantir, of course, it is the exposure. New, bigger clients uh, will be easier for them uh, to come by via IBM. And of course, they get access to IBM's huge sales force, some two and a half thousand people globally. For comparison, Palantir currently has a sales team of just about 30 people. Palantir is saying that they plan uh, to, uh, to strike more of these deals in the future. Now, of course, for IBM, this is good news for them too. They see this form of simplification of their tools as a way uh, to access more customers. They say that's going to help them get their customers who use their AI offerings up from about 20% to about 80%. And of course, anything that's going to boost uh, sales uh, for IBM is good news. Uh, they also think it Will help to boost their hybrid cloud of course that is the big uh, that is the big commitment for the future of ibm so both sides very very enthusiastic about this deal david and as you said there of course investors also enthusiastic that's why we're seeing palantir getting a good uh, stock pop today some 15 percent at the highs now around nine ten percent david yeah by the way you probably didn't get to watch it emma but there was actually an advertisement for the hybrid cloud from ibm in the super bowl last night so that shows just how important it is to ibm those ads as you know are so not cheap late, david. David, for me, over in the UK, I can't keep up with it anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I didn't expect you to watch it. Thank you so much for that report from Emma Chandra. Coming up, we're going to be joined by Wells Fargo Vice Chairman Bill Daly, who also served as Chief of Staff to President Obama and as Secretary of Commerce under President Clinton. He is here with a very big announcement about investment, investing in less fortunate communities across the entire country. He will announce it here live and exclusively as Bill Daly of Wells Fargo. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. Lawyers for former President Trump are arguing that the impeachment charge against him should be dismissed. In a brief file today, Mr. Trump's defense team says he can't be tried since he's left office and that he did not incite an insurrection at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. They say the impeachment charge violates Mr. Trump's right to free speech and is constitutionally flawed. His trial in the Senate is set to begin tomorrow. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu pleaded not guilty today as his trial on corruption charges resumed in a Jerusalem courtroom. Mr. Netanyahu was indicted last year for fraud, breach of trust, and accepting bribes in three separate cases. Protesters gathered outside the courthouse as they have every week for several months. The demonstrators have been calling on Netanyahu to resign. Russia has been hit harder by the coronavirus pandemic than previously thought. Official data out today show Russia's death toll from COVID-19 in 2020 was nearly three times the level previously reported by the government and accounted for half of all excess deaths last year. The country's COVID-19 death toll for 2020 now stands at more than 162,000. The government had reported 57,000. China is pushing back its plans to vaccinate 50 million people. Bloomberg has learned China is now aiming to reach that milestone by the end of March. The nation had intended to meet the target by the Lunar New Year holiday, which starts this Thursday. In December, Beijing launched a plan to vaccinate key groups of people, including healthcare and government workers and those in other essential services. 
Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks so much, Mark. Inequality in our society did not start with the coronavirus, but the pandemic has put a harsh spotlight on the great and growing disparities when it comes to income, wealth, and services. Wells Fargo today is announcing a major investment to address some of those disparities. And to make the announcement, we now welcome Bill Daly. He's Wells Fargo Vice Chairman of Public Affairs. Mr. Daly served as Secretary of Commerce under President Clinton and Chief of Staff to President Obama. So, Bill, thank you so much for being here. Make your announcement. What are you doing? Thank you very much, David. Appreciate the opportunity. We are really proud today to announce that we've made uh, capital investments in the six mi African American minority deposit institutions located from uh, California to New York to North Carolina, Tennessee, South Carolina, Alabama. These institutions, many of which have been around for almost over 100 years, are really vital to these communities. And if we're going to begin to address the inequity that's in many of our communities, these institutions need to be healthier and need to be able to grow to be more competitive. They're part of the financial sort of ecosystem. We have community banks, we have the big banks, but these institutions are vital. They know their communities. And in the African-American community, we know of the economic disparity that's occurred. So we're making capital investments, but beyond those capital investments, we're building relationships that we can bring some of the resources and talent of Wells Fargo, a national institution, to help these smaller institutions, whether it's in technology, financial literacy, a whole host of areas, so that we're not just making a investment, we're building a relationship. Charlie Sharp, our CEO, announced this last March before the pandemic. Uh, and, and it took us a little longer because we didn't want to just make an investment, we wanted to build a relationship with the leadership of these institutions. So we're excited. There'll be more investments uh, coming over the next number of months uh, in African-American MDIs in other parts of the country. But we think it's a, it's a great step to help them grow and help them grow in their communities where they're so strong and they have such a long history. How did you choose these particular firms to make the investment in? And what difference do you think this infusion of money, capital, will mean for them? Well, first of all, we, we chose them. There, there used to be about 100 African-American MDIs. They're now down to 20 or so. And so we, we have engaged every one of them to see if their capacity to build these relationships. Obviously, most institutions today need capital. Um, no different than many other uh, banks and, and community institutions. But uh, so we've worked closely with these six over the last number of months. Um, and we have resources near where these banks are located. So as I mentioned, the relationship we're trying to build will be stronger because we have resources there to work with, uh, with teams that can work with these institutions. We think they're important for the African-American communities, not only because of the history, but because of the understanding of the communities. And if their clients, if they can be stronger, it gives them the greater ability, both by capital infusions and deposits, to then turn around and have more aggressive lending in their communities to help those small businesses, those institutions that are really struggling, uh, that, that I think it, it, it strengthens the entire sort of financial ecosystem. And in the African-American communities, as we know, they have been not only enormously hit by the COVID, but by the economic impact of COVID uh, over the last um, 10 months or so. Well, exactly. Um, and as you know so well, Bill, if you go back in time long before the pandemic, there was a substantial underbanking and unbanking of a lot of those minority communities, those African-American, those black communities across the country. We saw it come to the fore with the PPP, where people couldn't get the money in part because they didn't have a bank. How will right. this help address that issue? Well, by strengthening these institutions, they will be able to do a better job. They will be able to deal better with their customers to provide the resources to them. Many of these smaller institutions, MDIs, didn't have the te technical capacity or the wherewithal because of their size to really 
be engaged in PPP as much as they would have liked to. Now, Congress made some exceptions, tried to be more forward-leaning to help them along with CDFIs. But, but many of the large institutions like our, ours are in some of the same communities that these are in. But we don't have the history, the knowledge, the relationships and understanding of the community uh, as, as well as these do. So I think strengthening them and having this sort of relationship, not just giving them capital, which others are, are doing right now, but Charlie Sharp, our CEO, did not want to just add capital to these companies. He really wanted to see whether we could help them by building a relationship and bringing more of the resources of Wells Fargo to these smaller institutions. Right. And we do think it will make a difference for them, hopefully yeah. their communities, yeah. Uh, and their customers. Bill, as you know so terribly well, your CEO, Charlie Scharf, that you've referred to a couple times, has been pretty outspoken on this, including in addition to this investment last June, saying he wanted to double the percentage of black leadership at Wells Fargo, which I think at the time was something like 6%. Can, do you have an, and you want to do that within five years. Do you have an update on how you're making on that progress? Well, we're, we are making progress. Just take our operating committee. There are three uh, members now of, of color. We had none uh, eight months ago. So there's progress at the top, but the real progress that has to be made is throughout the entire institution. And Charlie started a process. There are some 35 different projects that we're working on right now to change uh, the diversity and inclusion in Wells Fargo. And we are making progress. Obviously, the pandemic has caused everyone to slow down on certain things, but he's committed and the leadership of this institution's committee to make a difference. Albeit, this is not easy and it does take time, but the commitment is there from the top and it is being driven throughout the whole organization. So we do expect to see the sort of goals he's mentioned um, be met, uh, albeit they difficult. Uh, but we're we're committed to it, and uh, so we're we're making good progress. And I think there's a spirit of change as we're trying to transform this institution in many other ways. Um, but in this area, it's vital that we we improve ourselves for the future of this institution. Bill, great to have you here. Congratulations on your announcement. I must say, I didn't know we'd gone from 100 to 20 MDIs across the country. That's a really stunning fact. Thank you so much to Bill Daly. He's Wells Fargo Vice Chairman of Public Affairs. Coming up, we're going to discuss President Trump's second impeachment trial with a member of his defense team from the last time. He's Harvard Law School Professor Emeritus Alan Dershowitz. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The Senate begins its second impeachment trial of President Trump tomorrow. And to take us through the law involved, we welcome now Alan Dershowitz. He's professor of law emeritus at Harvard and an acclaimed trial lawyer who was part of the Trump impeachment defense team the first time around. And he's also the host of the new podcast, The Dersh Show. So, Professor, thanks so much for being with us. And you are clear you're not part of the defense team this time, uh, although you've been outspoken about what's going on. We now have the filing. I've not seen, I just saw a summary of it now, from uh, former President Trump defending himself. Give us a sense of what he's arguing. Well, there are going to be three basic arguments. Number one, that the Senate has no jurisdiction over a former office holder, even one who was impeached while he was serving in office that the purpose of impeachment is removal, and if you can't be removed, it is not an independent power of the Senate to disqualify you. If it were, then they could impeach Nikki Haley if they think maybe she's going to run for president against Biden next time. It would give the the Senate enormous power to determine who candidates are in future elections. So that's number one. Number two, they're going to argue that the speech itself was fully protected by the Brandenburg principle under the First Amendment. And number three, they're going to argue that you can't impeach a president for making a speech that was protected by the First Amendment. 
So let's take those in order, if we could. I'm curious about the <laughs> argument that you cannot uh, try someone for impeachment after they've left office. As you know terribly well, that's happened at least three times, not with presidents, but with other officers of the government, going right. all the way back to the first impeachment, I think, with Senator Blunt. And by the way, at the con Constitutional Convention, there was a, an impeachment going on over in England at the time with somebody who had actually resigned, right, from being Governor yeah, General yeah, of but, Bengal. You know, the United States rejected the English approach explicitly. Uh, one of the people at the Constitutional Convention said, we want to use the English approach, maladministration. And Madison said, no, basically, we fought a war against Britain. We don't want to use their approach. That would allow the Senate to determine that the president sits at its pleasure. So they rejected the British approach. No president, in fact, no office holder, has ever been actually disqualified after they left office. They tried it a few times, but the Senate has always prevented uh, the disqualification standing alone. You can disqualify after you've removed, but there's no precedent for actually disqualifying. It would be the first time ever, and it would create a very dangerous precedent. Under the brief that was filed by the House managers, there's no statute of limitations. You could go back to Jimmy Carter. You could go back to Barack Obama. You could go back to Bill Clinton. You can go back to anybody who ever held office under the United States and impeach them, even if it was years and years and years ago. They don't limit their brief only to presidents who have been impeached while in office. If they did that, I think they'd have a somewhat stronger case. So, 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 Professor, I just want to be clear in my own mind here. My understanding is what was rejected at the Constitutional Convention was maladmi maladministration, which is a British approach. But I don't believe that they specifically rejected the possibility of trying somebody for impeachment after they left office, which was happening oh, no, at was the not, time with Warren Hastings, discussed. the governor general who had resigned from, the, from Bengal, right? Yeah, but remember, too, that in Britain, they didn't impeach high officers like the prime minister. They were just simply removed at the will of the parliament. They removed, they impeached relatively low-ranking officers. And so it's not a model for the United States. And the other case, obviously, the Melnock case, was one where the, the Senate voted initially that they had jurisdiction. And then there were enough senators, 23 of them, voting against jurisdiction to result in an in acquittal. So the precedents are equivocal. The constitutional language is not as clear as it could be, but it seems to strongly imply that the two go together, that you can only disqualify after you've removed. The word and is between them, not the word or. Let's go to the second argument, the, the First Amendment argument, as it were. You and I have talked before about Brandenburg and its application here. But a somewhat different question, and maybe this goes to the third argument, actually. Is it the right standard? I mean, there are all sorts of situations in an employment situation where you can dismiss an employee for sure. exercise of their First Amendment rights. And to some oh, extent, the President of the United States is an employee of all of us, isn't he? No, it's exactly the opposite. They rejected the concept that the president is merely an employee. That's the British approach. They accepted a principle that the president can only be impeached and removed if specific criteria have been satisfied, treason, bribery, other high crimes and misdemeanors. Let me tell you how absurd that argument would go if you take it to its logical extreme. Let's assume a Muslim were elected president, and they decided to impeach him on the ground that he's a Muslim. Well, the Constitution says no religious test shall ever be applied. And some of the people will say, but it doesn't apply to impeachment. Of course it applies to impeachment. The Constitution says, the First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. And the courts have interpreted law to mean any action with consequences. And so I think the First Amendment does bind uh, the, the Senate when it comes to impeachment. The 144 scholars have not only taken the opposite view, but they've said it would be frivolous to raise this argument, essentially saying that anybody who raised that argument could be disbarred. Um, that's absurd. It's a good but, argument. It's a strong but, argument. It should be raised by the Senate. It will be raised, and it may very well prevail. Professor, doesn't that argument uh, hinge critically on whether, in fact, there was incitement to insurrection? I take it no one yes. would argue there's a First Amendment right to incite to insurrection. So, really, you don't have a First Amendment claim unless, in fact, you did not that, incite exactly to insurrection, Right. right? But it's not even a close question. If you look at Clarence Bland and Brandenburg, he got up there surrounded by Klansmen with hoods and guns and crosses, and he called for revenge against the senators in the House. And he said, send the Jews back to Israel and the blacks back to Africa. And he called for, you know, go march on the Capitol. Nine to nothing, the Supreme Court upheld that as constitutionally protected. This speech is pablum compared to other speeches that I defended, the Chicago 7, Bruce Franklin, many, many other cases where you get agitators standing and saying, fight back, but, you know, don't take it, don't sit down. This is a typical capital speech. Sure, it's made by the president of the United States, 
But the First Amendment doesn't distinguish between who has rights to be protected uh, in the exercise of free speech. So I think the reasonable people could perhaps could argue the argument that it's frivolous to raise this is utterly irresponsible, and 144 scholars are just dead wrong. And I challenge any of them to debate me on that issue. But whether frivolous or not, I mean, in the Brandenburg situation, although the speech was contemptible, no question about it, it was, why don't we, at some future date, the 4th of July, I believe it was, have people march yeah. to Washington. This was the President of the United States on the mall with thousands of angry people that he'd asked to come, right. saying, go fight like hell, go up to the Capitol. That was much more right. imminent, wasn't it, which was relevant in Brandenburg to the Supreme Court. Yeah, but not as imminent as it has to be under the Constitution. If he was standing in front of the Capitol building and said, now go break in, commit violence, uh, destroy property, hurt people, that would satisfy the standards. But what he was doing was advocating. He used the words peaceful and patriotic. It fits squarely within the concept of advocacy rather than incitement. And certainly that argument should be made, should be considered. They can call experts on it and uh, let them decide. But what I'm worried about is that a decision that it's not covered by the First Amendment would have a terrible precedential effect on others, mostly people on the left who are the ones who are prosecuted for making these kinds of radical speeches like the Chicago 7. If not for the First Amendment, Chicago 7 would have been prosecuted and many of the others would have been prosecuted and convicted successfully. The First Amendment stands against uh, the government prosecuting anyone, no matter how high their station or low their station for advocating, even advocating violence. Uh, the Supreme Court has said advocacy of violence is protected as long as it's advocacy and not imminent incitement. Okay. It's always a treat to be able to talk with you, Professor. Really appreciate your time today. That <laughs> is Alan Dershowitz. He is Professor of Law Emeritus at Harvard. And as we say, the host of the new po podcast, The Dersh Show. Coming up, we're going to get an update on the coronavirus and the race to get people vaccinated as the virus continues to mutate. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. The idea that this can be done and we can get to herd immunity much before the end of next this summer is is very difficult. That was President Biden yesterday talking with Laura O'Donnell on CBS News and warning that it may take some time before we have herd immunity here in the United States. For an update on where we are, we welcome now Sam Fazelli. He is Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Pharmaceutical Analyst. So, so Sam, one of the questions I think a lot of us have is there seems to be a race between getting the vaccine out, some version of the other, and the vir virus actually changing on us. And now we had this story come out of South Africa with respect to the AstraZeneca virus uh, vaccine, I believe it was, and the the, the a mutation that exists down in South Africa. What is going on with that? Yeah, um, so basically there was a study done in, uh, in South Africa um, that started in the summer, and they enrolled 2,000 people. And within that study, they found that people up to about October 31st had a good 75, I can't remember exactly the number, 75, 80% efficacy, showed efficacy for the AstraZeneca vaccine. Post-October uh, 31st, when the number of infections caused by the new variant B1351 rapidly rose, then they found that actually there was no protection at all against mild to moderate disease. And that mild to moderate is important here, David, in that two-thirds of the patient uh, cases that they had were only mild. So in, in both, the group, both groups, vaccinated and controlled. So that's what all this uh, is about, that you went from 75 or, or odd percent protection to nothing when it came to uh, this new variant uh, as regards mild to moderate disease. Sam, what do we know, if anything, about the variant that comes out of Brazil? Uh, not a lot. Uh, it has similar mutations to the one in the UK and the one that was first identified as a city in South Africa. There's some overlap between these, but n n not a lot as regards to its ability to escape immunity caused by the vaccine or indeed the efficacy of the vaccine. We have to wait for similar data to be able to analyze that. What does this mean for us, us here in the United States? Uh, there are some of those variants who are showing up here as well. Uh, does it mean that, in fact, the virus is outracing us? It's beating us? Uh, not yet. 
but we certainly are perhaps not doing enough to um, to help ourselves win. Um, you need a lot more testing, and you need to do testing that detects for the variant. And when you do find it, you can't just take a week before you respond to the people who tested positive with their variant. You have to do it rapidly and tell them to self-isolate and absolutely circle them with uh, protection so that, that that virus doesn't pass on. So if we can do that, the test, test and trace and act, if you like, then, then we can control it before it takes over and before our vaccinations take over. Uh, can the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, assuming we do get emergency clearance for it, can that help us in it both because it's not as hard as I understand a transport, you don't need the same cold storage chain, uh, and also because you only need one shot? Yeah, uh, you do. That's absolutely right. Both of those are absolutely right, and it would make a lot of difference to get people covered. But we don't know how long the immunity with that one shot lasts. We do know that it didn't, it, it didn't work that well against moderate to severe. It had a 57% efficacy against the uh, right. South African uh, DB1351 right. variant. Right. And, and they didn't have mild cases. Right. So if they'd calculated mild right. in there too, it could have been like 20%. Who knows? Right. Sam, it's always great to talk with you. That's Sam Fazelli of Bloomberg Intelligence. Coming up, we're going to continue Balance of Power over on Bloomberg Radio.